yes, sorry. John chapter 19, um, from verse 17. That was what I was doing. So the soldiers took charge of Jesus. Carrying his own cross, he went out to the place of the skull, which in Aramaic is called Golgotha. Here they crucified him, and with him two others, one on each side and Jesus in the middle. Pilate had a notice prepared and fastened to the cross. It read, Jesus of Nazareth, King of the Jews. Many of the Jews read this sign, for the place where Jesus was crucified was near the city, and the sign was written in Aramaic, Latin, and Greek. The chief priests of the Jews protested to Pilate, do not write the King of the Jews, but that this man claimed to be the King of the Jews. Pilate answered, what I have written, I have written. When the soldiers crucified Jesus, they took his clothes, dividing them into four shares, one for each of them, with the undergarment remaining. This garment was seamless, woven in one piece from top to bottom. Let's not tear it, they said to one another. Let's decide by lot who will get it. This happened that the scripture might be fulfilled, which said, they divided my garments among them and cast lots for my clothing. This is, so this is what the soldiers did. Near the cross of Jesus stood his mother, his sis, mother's sister Mary, the wife of Clopas, and Mary Magdalene. When Jesus saw his mother there and the disciple whom he loved standing nearby, he said to his mother, Dear woman, here is your son, and to the disciple, here is your mother. From that time on, the disciple took her into his home. Later, knowing that all was now completed, and so that the scripture would be fulfilled, Jesus said, I am thirsty. A jar of wine vinegar was there, so they soaked a sponge in it, put the sponge on a stalk of the hyssop plant, and lifted it to Jesus' lips. When they had received the drink, Jesus said, It is finished. With that he bowed his head and gave up his spirit. This is the word of the Lord. Does God suffer? Well, let me tell you, I have suffered this week, trying to work out if God, in his divinity, suffered. And it, it's been making my head hurt and my heart a little bit happy because I got to be a theology geek again for a week. And then in the middle of last week, as I was just about getting my head around this stuff, um, a girl who I'd been to um, uni with died after being in a coma. And I had to start reading everything again. Because all of a sudden, this thing that I'd kind of managed to keep in my head as, as kind of a purely academic question was blown out of the water in the face of actual real life. Because where was Jesus, where was God in death? Was, was God, did God suffer with me? Did Jesus suffer with me? With her? What did any of this mean and why on earth did it matter? And, and part of me wanted to think that, that God was suffering because her loved ones were suffering. And I wanted to think that God must be suffering alongside her right now because otherwise it just wasn't fair. But then, but then I also wanted God to be really strong because I, I believe that God is this creator, this mighty God. And I wanted him to be able to, to rule over it. I didn't want a God, you know, we, her family, I'm sure, had, had hundreds of people around them saying, it's okay, you know, heaven's there and she's, she's in heaven and that's great and we want to walk alongside you in your pain. But what we wanted from God was for him to say that he was above it all and he had got it in his hands. And so I started reading again and things, things began to click a little bit more. Because what I've learned about theology over the last, goodness knows how long, how many years I've been trying to study it, is that it doesn't work if we don't let it connect with our hearts. And what we believe matters because we're not just believing kind of random things about, about some random, thi random God. This is our God who we give our lives to and who saved us. And so what we believe about the guy who saved us is huge. 
And so I went back to the, to the beginning. Does God suffer? What did they say in the early church when they were tasked with this? You know, Jesus had come among them. He'd walked among them. And then they had all these testaments and these, these bits of writings and these experiences of people. And they tried to work out who God was, who Jesus was, who the Spirit was, and how that all fit together. And the idea that God could suffer, not just as man through Jesus, but in his divinity, was there at the beginning of these conversations. A guy called Cyril of Alexandria, who I think Rod's talked about and whose name I absolutely love, um, said that while it's okay to say the Son as man suffered on the cross, we make it clear that God the Son suffered in his humanity, which is capable of suffering, but not his divinity. God didn't suffer as, as God. He suffered as a man, in his nature as man. Are you with me? Hold on. And the more I've thought about it this past week, the more comfort I've found in the fact that God is greater than suffering. And that God suffered only through Jesus' humanity. Because if Jesus had suffered in his divinity as God, what comfort could he give us? He'd have this eternal perspective that we have no idea about. He'd, he'd know the beginnings and the ends. He, he can see the story all, all set out before him. But when we suffer, we just get this one really rubbish chapter that we have to work through. And so the idea that Jesus suffered as man in his humanity means that he knows how we feel. And as we explore this a little bit more this evening, we're going to look at three things because I haven't quite let go of my Baptist roots. The first is that God is impassable, not passive. The second is that God's love is shown through his humanity. And the third, and I think probably the most important, is that God's love is perfect. And so let's get started. God is impassable, but not passive. What on earth does impassable mean? Yeah, I just agreed, completely forgotten what it meant. <laughs> but impassibility describes the theological doctrine that actually God doesn't experience pain or pleasure attached to, to the things of others. God doesn't feel you know, isn't swayed and moved by his emotions. He remains unchanged. And one of the reasons that people, particularly in the last century, have kind of railed against that so much is because of the Second World War and Auschwitz, which changed the world forever. And they asked these questions of where God is when it hurts in a way perhaps that, that had, hadn't been done for a long time. Because all of a sudden, this evil was in their midst, and they were trying desperately to work out where God was in it. But when we look at this definition of impassibility, it doesn't mean that, that God doesn't feel. It doesn't mean that he isn't passionate about his people, that he doesn't love his people. But it does mean that he, he doesn't change his mind according to his feelings. Because in the Old Testament, we see, don't we, this God who is aggrieved at Israel's rejection, tender as he forgives them again and again. We see a God who doesn't change. We see a God who is impassable, but far from passive. And he isn't passive in the face of our pain today. He doesn't view it as we might view an episode of EastEnders, which is like, oh, they look like they're having a rubbish time. I'm just going to watch because there's not a lot I can do about it. He wants to get alongside us in this. He wants to get alongside us in our pain. And so he sent Jesus to be man, to walk in man's shoes. And the ancient fathers, when they were trying to figure all of this stuff out, made this distinction between passions and affections. Um, the, an affection was was kind of something that flowed from the character. It was love. It might have been um, anger, but it was, it was completely controlled by the character of God. 
Whereas a passion, I don't know if, you know, when we get passionate about things, we can sometimes let things get carried away. I mean, have you heard Rod talk about bikes? He gets a bit carried away, as does my husband, but that's another story. God's passion for us doesn't make him change his mind about who God is and, and his plan for the world. But God's impassibility doesn't stop the fact that in Zephaniah it tells us that God delights in his children. God loves his people passionately. He loves you passionately. But God, the Father, doesn't suffer. Because the ultimate sign of God's love for his people was that he sent Jesus his son, who was there at the beginning to become man and to walk through life as we do. And we see here in the text what Jesus went through for us, don't we? God's love is shown through Jesus' humanity. Sorry. <coughs> God's love is shown through Jesus' humanity. If God had suffered in his divinity, I, I wouldn't find any comfort in that. It would be, oh yeah, well, that's, that's great, but you don't know how it feels to be, live a finite life. For the people you love to die and know that you're going to die eventually and not know how, and this whole uncertainty that we call human life. And this man who, who was God, Jesus, did things that, that God didn't do. Jesus was born. God was never born. Jesus died on a cross and God never dies. And that's because Jesus did these things as a man. And there is no heartbreak that we can face that Jesus has not faced. There is nothing that comes close to Jesus' cry on the cross which said, My God, my God, why have you forsaken? And in my darkest hours, the, the hours that I have thought would kill me, that has been my comfort. I've found hope in the God who is light and who doesn't need darkness to be light. He's just light. It's part of who he is. In him was life, and that light was the life of all mankind. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. Jesus went to the cross so that the darkness didn't overcome us. The darkness of Jesus' crucifixion could not quench the love of God. And the picture we see in John's gospel is of a desperate man. I can barely imagine the agony. I've tried to research it a little bit this week, and it, they think that possibly Jesus' cross would have weighed about 300 pounds. That, that's heavy. And not only that, but he carried the guilt and the grief of all mankind on his shoulders. And he hung between two criminals and died as a criminal. Jesus' agony is an astounding act of love, which I don't think I've ever understood better than I have done this week. And that's because... Jesus suffered in his humanity. And I was reading a lot of a theologian called Todd Billings, who writes um, incredibly, and he writes as the standpoint as a theologian, but also a man who has incurable cancer. And he says this, Our own loud cries and tears are not those of one's blazing new trails into grief. They are spirit-enabled sharing in the suffering of the one who has plunged even deeper into the darkness than us, yet not without hope. Not without hope, because the story didn't end at the cross. He was risen, and his, his rising forever defined hope. Whatever we go through, whatever you're going through tonight, it was felt in Jesus, rejected by friends, the loss of someone you love, 
betrayal, the weakness of your body. The Gospels see this. We have this story of, of Jesus' story unfolding, almost getting worse and worse and getting more and more painful. And as I mentioned earlier, some of the, the theologians who lived through the Second World War and the Holocaust tried to, tried to piece together this new God. They tried to find a way that the God they trusted in could have allowed these atrocities to happen. And they, they came to the decision that if God hadn't suffered in his divinity, he was a monster. It made him, for them, someone unworthy to be praised. And Jürgen Moltmann, who was one of the, the main guys, wrote this book called The Crucified God, said this, A God who is incapable of suffering is a being who cannot be involved. The one who cannot suffer cannot love. He thought that only by Jesus suffering in his divinity was, was the thing that was going to show his love for us. And that a God who was impassable was distant, aloof, and uncaring. And we get that, don't we? We want to speak to people who, who kind of get where we're coming from, who know our pain, who know our experiences. And it's hard sometimes not to agree with them because so offering, suffering is the price we pay in human love. All of our loving relationships involve sacrifice at some level or another. From the great to the small. Parents give up their sleep for screaming babies. Cyclists' wives give up their living rooms for bikes. My friends give up their sanity by listening to me bang on about mental health all day. We can't experience love without a little bit of suffering to go along with it. Because human love has an end. But God's love is greater than that. And if there is nothing else you, you remember from tonight, I ask that it's this one. That God's love is perfect. And because God's love is perfect, it doesn't require suffering. God doesn't need to suffer in order to love us. He loves us because it flows from his character and God is love. 1 John 1 verse 5 says, this is the message we have heard from him and declare to you. God is light. In him there is no darkness at all. God's love and light were not extinguished on the cross. Because God's love and light are the very things that sent Jesus to the cross and raised him again. God's wrath and his anger aren't like ours. They don't control him or change his mind. Because they can't be separated from who God is. And God is love. The impass impassable, unchanging God affirms his love for his people and his power that he has. Because he has the backbone to take on terror and overcome it in Christ. God doesn't need to suffer to, to love us in all its fullness. But he sent Jesus to suffer as we do, to suffer more than we could ever imagine so that we would know that he loves us. He is love. And our very existence is a testament to that love because God didn't need to create us. And he didn't need to send his son to assure us all that we are Loved beyond measure. And if, if the suffering of Christ isn't the final, most beautiful revelation of the fact that God is, is unpassable, impassable, unchangeable, complete, then I don't know what is. Because we have a God who loves us enough to send his son, to send part of him to live and suffer as a man so that we can be drawn closer to him. It means that we have a God who, not who is not just strong enough to, to carry our heaviest load, but to beat it, 
And it means whatever you're facing tonight, Jesus has faced darker. And more than that, he's conquered that darkness. And I don't know about you, but that gives me a lot of comfort. Because as Jesus cried, it is finished. It was not just that his life was finished. It was that forevermore, he stood in between us and God and allowed us to draw close. The cross that meant to kill is our victory because God raised Jesus from the cross. See, from his head, his hands, his feet, sorrow and love flow mingled down. Did ever such love and sorrow meet, or thorns compose so rich a crown? God is impassable because he's king. God is love because he sent his son to suffer for us and with us. And God is love because through Christ he beat it. And one day, one day, we'll live with no more mourning, no more crying, and no more.